Steven here from Red Adolescence with another fragrance review. And this time we have a fragrance from the designer house of Van Cleef and Arpels. And the fragrance is called Midnight in Paris. Uh, now this is a fragrance that I recently just finished up testing with. I was recently asked by one of my subscribers to film a review on this fragrance. So here you are. Um, but you know, I just finished up testing so I just felt like the time was appropriate. So very glad to be doing it now. Now Van Cleef and Arpels, I just called it a designer house and that's primarily because when they first started they were a jewelry company and they still make jewelry and they have pre uh, precious stones and Van Cleef and Arpels are actually brothers-in-law. They met of course via marriage in the late 1800s and that's when they went ahead to erect the very first shop in France. So the first boutique was uh, established in 1906 and then between 1909 and 1939 uh, within that 30 year period they went ahead and you know established quite a few other boutiques in the area it wasn't until 1942 that the pair decided to emigrate to New York and then they set up the very first boutique there and then since then they've already uh, located uh, a few other shops in Asia so on and so forth so now if I'm not mistaken their products are available in many many parts of the world so congratulations to Van Cleef and Arpels for their continued success and just for the fact that they're you know, still coming out with great merchandise, whether it's a fragrance or jewelry or even watches. Uh, Van Cleef and Arpels has their own line of watches. Now, they actually didn't decide to enter the fragrance industry until 1976, uh, when they released their very first fragrance for women called First. So I just feel like the name's appropriate. That's actually the bottle that I have sitting on this shelf uh, or on the windowsill behind me. And it's a floral aldehyde fragrance and I think it's a pretty good, you know, entrance into the fragrance industry and it really got, you know, they really kicked it off, I would say, two years later with their first men's uh, fragrance release, which was released in 1978 and it's simply called Van Cleef and Arpels Pour Homme. Um, since then, they've been pretty consistent at releasing fragrances. I do think that they cater a little bit more toward the feminine crowd, um, but nevertheless, Presently, if I'm not mistaken, I think they have 39 fragrances in their inventory. So they've been pretty consistent over these past 40 years, I would say. 40 years, uh, give or take. Now, this fragrance was released in September of 2010, so it's one of the more recent releases with, of course, the most recent release uh, this year in 2013. The perfumers behind this particular fragrance are uh, Domitia Bertier and Olivier Polge. Uh, Bertier is, of course, responsible for Victor and Rolf's Spice Bomb, which he also collaborated on with Olivier Polge. Then, of course, Olivier Polge has done L'Anonyme for A Lab on Fire, so he's dabbled in both the designer industry and the French, uh, the uh, niche branch of the fragrance industry. Uh, so that, to me, just suggests that the two perfumers may have pretty good chemistry with each other and they just know how to work with each other. Now, this is not uh, particularly one of my favorite fragrances, although I do love the smell. Uh, so don't get me wrong. Uh, for some reason, I just don't find myself reaching for it quite as often. Um, but nevertheless, I do love having this fragrance in my collection. Uh, not only for the smell, but more so for the bottle. I just think it's a beautiful, beautiful presentation. And much of it is evocative of its name, Midnight in Paris. Uh, Midnight in Paris, I'm sure the name comes from the 1962 uh, jazz record by jazz composer Duke Ellington. Um, which was received quite successfully, as a matter of fact. And then, of course, more recently, there was a, a movie that hit the mark, the, the film industry in 2011, directed by Woody Allen, also called uh, Midnight in Paris. I'm not sure how well that did, uh, but nevertheless, this is an excellent fragrance. I'm just not sure what the correlation is between the smell and then the music. But, of course, it's all subjective, it's ambiguous, it's interpretive. And um, I'll let you know what I think about the smell, but next up we have the presentation from Midnight in Paris by Van Cleef and Arpels. Here we have the presentation from Midnight in Paris by Van Cleef and Arpels. Uh, first up we have the box, and the first thing that you'll notice is this pretty nice design here. It's almo it almost looks like an eclipse. You have the name of the house and the name of the fragrance here in the front of the box. On the bottom here you have the concentration. It's in this beautiful uh, indigo color, I would say. Nothing going on in the sides of the box. But on the back here we have the name of the fragrance again, and Hot Perfumery, which is a line um, by Van Cleef and Arpels written underneath the name. Another fragrance part of this line is called Fury, which is a fragrance for women, so this is the men's counterpart. 
on the bottom here you have the UPC code uh, just the ingredients some other information the serial number over here on the bottom left and at the top here you have the Van Cleef and Arpels logo uh, nothing too much else going on with this box pretty simple box I do apologize for the condition though when I was packing it away it got dented a bit now I think the uh, true highlight or the beauty of this presentation is the bottle so as you'll notice you have a bunch of or a sequence of dots here on the front they're connected by lines which suggests that it's constellation so I just imagine you know being in Paris looking up at the night sky and this is what I see very beautiful bottle you have this nice hue transition uh, from the bottom left hand corner where it's like an ambery orangey hue to like a dark blue on the top right hand corner now another reviewer mentioned this uh, that it looks very much like a sunset and I do agree with that either a sunset or a sunrise um, I just think that that you know it may be me just being a little over analytical but a sunrise doesn't really occur at midnight hence the name of the fragrance midnight in Paris but again I'm just you know over analyzing but beautiful bottle nevertheless love it the bottom here you have the size and the concentration once again made in France and then you actually have the serial number here on the back side on the uh, bottom portion of the back the cap has like this checkered pattern on it uh, the atomizer actually works very well for this fragrance and the cap clicks into place very securely so you can pick it up from the cap and there's no fear of it falling off midnight in paris written on the left shoulder here van cleef and arpel is written on the right and that's really it as far as the presentation for this fragrance goes now as far as the smell goes for midnight in paris um there are two concentrations to this fragrance so just be mindful of that there's an eau de toilette and an eau de parfum uh, they both smell quite similar, although I've heard people say that the Eau de Parfum might be a, a bit stronger or a bit heavier, if I could even use that word. I just think that one will last you a bit longer, one won't project as loudly, um, one will project more subtly but in a longer period of time. So I don't think the smell is different at all. Just some people say one smells a bit stronger or a bit heavier. Uh, the one that I have here is the Eau de Toilette concentration, so that's the one that I will be reviewing for you today. Um, now when the fragrance opens up you do get very mild citrus overtones but it's nothing that's you know truly ever overpowering any of the other ingredients in the composition so you have a bit of lemon a bit of bergamot um, and of course uh, you know I am very familiar with how each one of them smell um, I just think that the bergamot might be just a little bit stronger than the lemon in this fragrance just because I don't get that zestiness of the lemon but nevertheless neither one of those two ingredients is very strong in the opening what I get in the opening is really like a smooth powdery and I would probably have to say that the most important adjective is non animalic leather note um, it's weird and I think that's that's one of the things or aspects of the olfactory nature of this composition that really allow comparisons to be made between uh, Van Cleef and Arpels Midnight in Paris and then a fragrance by Bulgari called Black uh, for those of you who don't know, Bulgari's Black smells quite heavily of rubber. There is a burnt rubber accord in that fragrance. And I see where the comparisons are coming from. Of course, they both have their own nuances. And while that leather note in this fragrance allows comparisons to be made between the two, there's just a host of other ingredients in this composition which really serve to you know, allow it to stand as a fragrance of its own, having its own compositional nature. Um, but I do get that leather note, but more importantly, it's non-animalic, it's smooth, it's powdery, and even balmy. You know, there's a clean feeling to this fragrance too, and I hope I don't get crucified for saying this, but it almost smells like, um, like fresh dryer sheets. I mean, it has like a powdery quality to it, which is why when I smelled this initially, and I still get to smell a half hour later, um, you know, it smells quite powdery to me. Um, and I was quite surprised because I expected there to be iris in this fragrance. Iris is a floral note that's notorious for giving fragrances a clean powdery feel. Prada's Infusion Dome, Diorome. Um, I just, you know, I get that same feeling from this fragrance, but to my surprise when I looked up the official note breakdown, iris isn't listed as an ingredient in this fragrance. Nevertheless, uh, Lily of the Valley is listed as an ingredient in this fragrance and also being familiar with the how how that smells um, 
it doesn't really show me that that's a concentrated ingredient because I'm not getting it too much. Now, is this fragrance considered a solid floor just because it only contains the lily of the valley note? Um, yeah, probably. Um, it's just accented in so many different ways. Now that smooth, you know, leather note is certainly the strongest note in this fragrance. No doubt about that. Um, but there's also a very mild incense note. With incense, it's very simple, I would say, to determine if it's frankincense or myrrh. And to me, neither one of them smells very smoky. And with many fragrances, when you say incense, I think the first evocation or the first thing that's brought to mind is this very smoky fragrance, something along the lines of uh, Interlude Man by Amouage. And there is actually no comparison between the, those two fragrances. But this is a fragrance that really doesn't have that smoky character to it. So if just by hearing that incense is a very strong note in this fragrance, if that turns you off or if that's off-putting in any sense, really um, take that very mildly because the incense note in here, which I believe to be myrrh, um, actually does not smell smoky at all. It just might give it a very mild religious evocation, if that makes any sense, just because it's an ingredient that's used in, of course, many religious practices and ceremonies. Um, but I believe it to be myrrh. Um, again, nothing offensive at all. And even with that leather note, sometimes you get a very animalic leather note. Um, certainly not getting anything like that in this composition. Now, although I do believe that the leather is a star player in this fragrance, there are other contributing factors, and one of those is the tonka bean. There are some gourmand aspects to this fragrance just because it retains edible qualities. And it's not a full-fledged gourmand, so please don't get me wrong, um, but I do get a great deal of tonka bean in the opening. And then almond is listed as a note, as is benzoin. Now, benzoin is, of course, a resin that is not classified as a gourmand ingredient, but it does serve in giving this fragrance a smoky vanilla type of a quality. And it's quite unusual because tonka bean is said to, of course it has a smell of its own, but it also says it's said to have a vanilla quality to it as well, as well as a nutty quality. And this is one of those few fragrances when you smell it, you can really pick out that almond note. Like many fragrances list almond as a note and it's not very, you know, perceivable or very distinguishable, but in this fragrance it really does stand out. It almost has that like cyanide type of a smell to it. And of course, you know, there are two types of almonds. You have the bitter almonds which have cyanide and it could potentially be toxic. And then you have the sweet almonds which is what you would find um, in stores today. But nevertheless, this one does have that kind of cyanide feel to it. And I know it sounds weird, but it just gives the fragrance a bit of a sharpness. So you have the tonka bean that gives it a slight nutty vibe, and then you have the almond, which is a nut, of course, so they work together pretty well, I would say. And then with the vanillic nature of the tonka bean and the van smoky vanilla type smell of the benzoin, and I believe there to be two varieties of benzoin in this fragrance, the, you know, Styrax Benzoin and then the original or normal Benzoin, if that makes sense. Um, and I just think they work together very well. So just goes to show you that formal training uh, sometimes does prevail. Um, and both perfumers have been formally trained, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, so just to recap, the leather is certainly the strongest note in this fragrance, which is what allows comparisons to be made between this fragrance and Bulgari's Black. And then we also have a great deal of tonka bean, gourmand elements, um, but certainly never overpowering, or at least not in my opinion. The overall smell of this fragrance is powdery, um, it's balmy, and it's clean at the same time. Um, and that's due to, I would say, the non-animalic leather note in conjunction with the lily of the valley, although it is mildly concentrated, but more so the tonka beans than anything. The tonka beans really do stand out. And this fragrance, you know, lasts on your skin for quite a while. I just think it turns into a skin scent quite uh, quickly. That's all I have to say about the smell. But next up, we have the rating for Midnight in Paris by Van Cleef and Arpels. Now, first up for the rating, we have uniqueness and overall smell. And this fragrance earned for me an 8 out of 10. 
the reason I did not give it a perfect score is because a lot of comparisons do get made and being that this is a more recent fragrance release um, only connotes that a bunch of other fragrances preceded it and of course it gets compared to Dior Homme, Dior's Homme Intense, some have even compared it to Carnar Barcelona's D600 just because of that powdery quality that it gives off and then of course many many comparisons have been made between this and Bulgari's Black. Bulgari Black is a bit more on the avant-garde side and my nose is really geared towards fragrances that smell weird so uh, for the most part that is my preference but I do love this fragrance and it's a beautiful smell so please don't get me wrong but just personally I would probably first reach for those other fragrances before I would reach for this one but nevertheless an 8 out of 10 is an excellent score in my book it's just personally I give it an 8 out of 10 and not a perfect score uh, next up we have longevity for this fragrance and I gave it a 7 out of 10 uh, this fragrance surprisingly for an eau de toilette concentration uh, which is the one that I'm reviewing lasts a pretty long time on my skin. The average is uh, four to six. I've gotten seven on a good day. Um, my only qualm with this fragrance is that it very quickly turns into a skin scent and it lacks in the projection department, which is why for projection, I ended up giving it a six out of 10. This one probably projects for about a half hour on average. On good days, I've gotten as much as an hour. And then after that, it sits very, very close to the skin. You don't get a scent bubble with this. I don't even think you get a scent bubble with this even when you first apply it, um, which is quite unfortunate. But again, I'm just going off the Eau de Toilette version and that's just the way that it performs on my skin. Good smell, I just think the performance isn't there, uh, which leads me into my next category, which is versatility. And I gave it an eight out of 10. Now, I do think that one thing that would, you know, better the performance of this fragrance is if it's worn more toward the um, hotter months of the year. Now, despite the leather and the incense, which I would think, you know, would convince someone that this is geared more toward the colder weather, I do think that the sun and being active and the heat will allow this fragrance to just evaporate off your skin and it would uh, allow it to perform a bit better in the hotter months. So, although it could be worn year-round, I think, my recommendation is that it be worn in the hotter months of the year. Now, as far as versatility in terms of the gender that could wear this fragrance, I think it's marketed for both gender. Uh, it's certainly marketed for men, but I think it's versatile in that it could be worn by both genders. Um, I think a woman could pull this fragrance off quite easily. Um, doesn't have too much of a masculine character or personality to it. And, you know, the powdery quality um, really gives leeway as far as women wearing this fragrance goes. Now, also ter uh, in terms of social occasions, I think it could be worn very casually. Um, it, it would make an excellent signature scent. Uh, that's something that has been mentioned by a few other reviewers. Um, it would also work well, I think, on a night out just because of the gourmand elements. Again, I think I would reach for other fragrances during a night out, but this one would work fairly well on a night out. Um, and I suppose it could be worn both semi-formally and formally. Uh, so I gave this an 8 out of 10 for versatility. And then last up we have presentation and I really could not bring myself to give this anything less uh, than a 10 out of 10. It really is quite a gorgeous bottle. You already know how I feel about that. And then that's what brings this fragrance to an average score or an overall rating of 7.8 out of 10. So there you have it. That was my review of Midnight in Paris by Van Cleef and Arpels. As always, thank you so much for watching. Please don't forget to comment, rate, and subscribe. It would be greatly appreciated. Feel free to join my Facebook group. I will leave a link in the description section below. As again, this has been Stephen with another fragrance review from Adolescence. Thanks for watching and accessorize accordingly.